Every culture has its own way of memorializing the dead. My family is from Zimbabwe and specifically of the Shona tribe. We sadly lost my maternal grandfather in December 2020 and my family and I are honored to invite you into his memorial service. In Shona, we call the ceremony Magadziro and it takes place over two days. The Magadziro is usually held a year after someone has passed away, but as my grandfather passed away during the height of the pandemic, we had to postpone the ceremony. Now, I'm aware that there are some slightly controversial concepts and spiritual practices involved that may conflict with your personal or religious beliefs. However, I ask you to keep an open mind as you watch and remain respectful in the comments. Good morning, guys. So today is Friday. Friday. Today's Friday. One of the main reasons we came is because my grandfather passed away a couple of years ago, but because of COVID, we didn't get a chance to do like a memorial service. So it's happening tonight and tomorrow. So yeah, today's gonna be a kid day with everybody just getting, getting ready for that. As with all events, there are a lot of preparations to be made, some of which start weeks or even months in advance. For the most part, these are the usual arrangements you would expect, such as catering and decorations. We'll discuss the more niche items as they come to play. As the different rituals play out, it is worth noting that Zimbabwe is very much a patriarchal society that, for the most part, still carries traditional gender roles and expectations. That is why you may notice a distinct lack of men doing the household chores. But do take comfort in knowing that the men do the barbecues. <laughs> In all seriousness, the differing expectations will be displayed throughout this video. For example, one of the essential items that needs to be purchased in advance is a cow. I couldn't tell you why, but tradition dictates that the cow is purchased by the sons-in-law of the deceased. In Shona, the sons-in-law are called Vakwasha. We come into the living room and then can you imagine? It's like me, freshly cut, like a whole cow. But guys, look at this, it's a head. Like, can you imagine just walking in, not expecting to see the head of a cow, and boom. Traumatic. The cow is slaughtered before the ceremony, and a specific part of it is eaten, unsalted, by my grandmother and my grandfather's surviving brothers. There are other rituals performed during the day, but these are usually held by the elders and my grandmother, whilst everyone else eats or preoccupies themselves. Now, this does pose a question of continuity, but we'll circle back to that later. The majority of the guests arrive late afternoon in preparation for the evening activities. The aim here is to stay up all night dancing and eating. The idea behind this, and truly the thesis of the whole ceremony, is to invite my late grandfather's spirit back, to let him know that we are excited for his return home. With that said, I can sum up the evening activities in three words. Eating, dancing and praying. Eating is self-explanatory. Dancing is a form of celebration. We celebrate my grandfather's life. We celebrate his return home, which is fitting truly because he loved to dance, even in his last months. The prayer is more spiritual than it is religious. Again, I wasn't present or able to film, but I understand this to have been a call to my grandfather and our ancestors, asking for my grandfather's spirit to return home. The spiritual element is a huge part of this cultural ceremony. And as you can imagine, it does present some conflict for our more religious friends and family whose religion does not allow such spiritual practices. As a result, some were unable to attend the ceremony in its entirety, and some attended the ceremony as a show of support but opted out of some rituals. <laughs> Thank you. 
People stay up all night eating and dancing and then when the sun rises, as a group, we make our way to my grandfather's grave. Now, I'll confess, I wasn't able to stay awake. I did fall asleep but luckily my uncle woke me up just in time to begin the morning rituals. Remember when I spoke about preparations? Well, that white linen cloth covering my grandfather's tombstone is an essential item that is required for this part of the ceremony. This is literally called the tombstone unveiling. At the Magadziro would be the first time that people see the tombstone. <laughs> Before the veil is lifted, there are speeches from the elders and my grandfather's family all put a token amount of money on his grave. Now this might get confusing so bear with me, but when I say my grandfather's family, I am referring specifically to the individuals with his last name. So that would be his children, his brothers, his brother's wives, his brother's children, his son's children, anyone with his last name. So whilst I am of course his family, for these purposes, this does not include me because this is my maternal grandfather and I of course take my father's last name. Okay, back to the ceremony. <laughs> Now following the unveiling, one of the Mororas lays on my grandfather's grave and everyone in attendance takes turns going up to her, take a sip of the beer from the container by her head and then pouring the remaining drink over her, then passing a dollar under the blanket covering her. As you can imagine, this is one of the rituals that some of our more religious family members chose to not participate in. And whilst we're here, I want to draw your attention to the zebra on my grandfather's tombstone. His totem is a zebra, so later on you will see a few of us wearing black and white clothing in honour of that, as well as the catering decorations being black and white in that same vein. <laughs> Following the rituals at the grave, the congregation makes its way back home singing and dancing. The belief is that we have now collected my grandfather's spirit and he is now back home with us. Again, we sing and dance to celebrate his return. Once everyone has returned home and had a chance to freshen up, the afternoon rituals can begin. And they begin by testing my grandmother's loyalty and faithfulness. She is required to step over this shaft three times and if she has not been with another man since the passing of my grandfather, the cloth will remain tied to the shaft. I don't know what would have happened if the cloth had untied, besides me fainting, of course. And I know what you're wondering, and yes, if a woman was to die before her husband, a similar ceremony would be held. But no, her widow would not be required to step over a shaft to show his faithfulness or loyalty. 
The reasoning being that a man can remarry quickly since he's unable to look after himself, so can take a wife to help him. Remember when I raised the question of continuity? Well, many elements of this ceremony are held privately amongst the elders and the widow or widower, and even the public rituals happen without much explanation or context. And that means when the next generation are conducting the ceremonies, they're often learning on the job. In the previous clip, the elders are explaining the order of proceedings to the host, likely because he hasn't had much exposure to the workings of this ceremony before. Anyway, back to the ceremony. In this part of the proceedings, my grandfather's remaining son is joined in the front by his late brother's sons. Here, my uncle is given my grandfather's name. The idea being that my grandfather has been reincarnated and his spirit now lives on through my uncle. One by one, everyone then goes up to my uncle, puts some money in the bowl in front of him and gives a short speech welcoming my grandfather back. The money is essentially a contribution towards the responsibilities that my uncle now takes over from my grandfather, such as caring for the family, specifically my grandmother. <laughs> The final step of the ceremony includes my grandmother selecting a new husband. She can choose from her son, her son's sons, and my grandfather's younger brothers. In the olden days, she would actually become the second or third wife of the brother she chose to marry. If she chose her son or one of her grandsons, of course she would not marry him, but it would instead symbolize that they are now the caretaker on behalf of my grandfather. And if it's not clear here, my grandmother chose her son. As I said, every culture has its own way of memorializing the dead. This is my family's tradition. It is different, it is special, and it is ours. Sadly, I don't think my future children will see this ceremony outside of this documentation. For the same reasons that I am unable to elaborate further on some of the rituals, I simply don't know more than what I have shared. My parents' generation would not be able to conduct this ceremony, and mine certainly wouldn't know where to begin. As such, it is likely that this tradition will die with my grandparents' generation. I am lucky to have witnessed it. Just as I am lucky to have known, loved, and been loved by such an intelligent and patient man as my grandfather. Please join me in wishing my grandfather an eternally peaceful rest. Rest in peace, Sakuru.